Hey everyone, welcome to BCP Med. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the SN2 reaction, that is the bimolecular nucleophilic substitution reaction. We're going to be taking a look at the nucleophile considerations, the polarized transition state of the SN2 reaction, and how the stereochemical inversion, aka the Walden inversion, associated with the SN2 occurs. Let's go ahead and get started. So first and foremost, I want to go over what exactly a nucleophilic substitution is in case you're not already familiar with it. So let's consider that we have a tetrahedral carbon shown in the blue with a leaving group on, uh, represented by the gold atom. So the nucleophile can go ahead and attack that blue carbon, aka an electrophilic carbon, and kick out the leaving group. That is, the carbon will actually now be bonded to the nucleophile and the leaving group will be separated as Lg minus, some anionic species. So the overall process for a nucleophilic substitution is that the nucleophile attacks the electrophilic carbon that possesses the leaving group, and then the nucleophile forms a new bond to that carbon, kicking out the leaving group, breaking that carbon-leaving group bond. In effect, substituting the nucleophile for the leaving group on the carbon. So the way that this happens on a orbital level is that the nucleophile is going to attack the anti-bonding orbital associated with the carbon leaving group bond. So if we have a tetrahedral carbon here, which has the leaving group in gold, that CLG bond has a purple orbital here, which represents the anti-bonding orbital, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. It's empty, it's higher in energy. But the nucleophile can go ahead and attack the tail of that anti-bonding orbital and push its electrons, namely its lone pair, into that orbital. When that happens, the orbital becomes filled and disrupts the bonding between the carbon and the leaving group. As a result, what happens then is that the leaving group carbon bond starts to break and lengthen as a result of the filling of that anti-bonding orbital. However, when that orbital gets filled by the nucleophile electrons, it's no longer acting as an anti-bonding orbital to the nucleophile. It's acting as a bonding orbital. And so at the same time, a new bond to the nucleophile begins to form. The carbon, in effect, loses its elect an electron pair, or the bond, to the leaving group, but gains a new electron pair and a new bond from the nucleophile. Now, very importantly, this goes through what is known as an associative transition state. That means that the leaving group bond is breaking at the same time that the nucleophile bond is forming. Specifically, it goes through a uh, trigonal bipyramidal transition state where the um, other three groups are planar and then the nucleophile and the leaving group form the vertices of the trigonal bipyramid. This transition state is heavily polarized, which is to say that the leaving group and the nucleophile both carry a partial negative charge. The nucleophile, because it had one to begin with when it was attacking, as a result of the lone pair or its negative charge density, and the leaving group because it's receiving the electron density from the carbon bond. So you can see that the electron density is in this transition state being pushed from the nucleophile upwards towards the carbon and then from the carbon towards the leaving group, right? Again, this transition state is associative, meaning both of these things are happening at the same time. You might wonder, well, doesn't that violate the principle of carbon having more than five, uh, more than four bonds, right? Isn't this five bonds? Well, these dotted lines aren't true bonds. They're both occupying the same orbital. And so this is actually fine. This is not a quote unquote Texas carbon. However, this polarized transition state is really important because it's well stabilized in polar sol solvents, but it's not very stable in nonpolar solvents. As a result, in order for the transition, in order for the reaction to proceed, the transition state has to be stable. The, right, the activation barrier has to be relatively low. And so SN2 reactions are highly dependent on solvent polarity. They are what are known as polar reactions. They work pretty well in polar solvents like DMSO or acetone, but they do not work well in nonpolar solvents like hexanes. The other major thing that happens in an SN2 reaction, and it's sort of the prototypical result of an SN2 reaction, is that you have a stereochemical inversion at the center where the nucleophile substitutes the leaving group. So because the nucleophile attacks from the backside, the other bonded atoms, right, so those red atoms that we see in our uh, tetrahedral diagram, are actually pushed away from the nucleophile, flipping the stereochemistry. So Let's go ahead and look at that, right? 
So initially, we start off with a tetrahedral carbon that has the leaving group on one side. As the nucleophile approaches from the back, though, it repels away those um, three other atoms, those red atoms, into that planar trigonal transition state. As a result, it's almost like imagine opening an umbrella. Your hand pushing the umbrella plunger is the nucleophile, and then the other atoms are the frills of the umbrella. As you push the plunger forward to open the umbrella, the frills go from pointing towards you towards being completely open in a sort of flat position. That represents the trigonal planar uh, or the trigonal bipyramidal transition state with the planar configuration in the middle, right? As a result, then, if you push the umbrella too far, right, as you push your hand all the way to the end, you might actually flip the frills so that they point away from you. Like if the wind is pushing really hard, the umbrella like goes and inverts itself. That is the ultimate extent of the SN2. So once the nucleophile pushes things towards that planar transition state, it keeps pushing and breaks the bond to the leaving group, pushing all the atoms towards the opposite side, right? So the nucleophile comes in from the back and pushes all of the other atoms towards the opposite side, inverting the stereochemical uh, uh, center. So if you started with an R stereocenter, you will end up with an S stereocenter after the substitution. Similarly, if you started with S, you will now end up with R after the nucleophilic substitution. A third thing to consider for the nucleophilic substitution reaction is that it follows bimolecular reaction kinetics. What does that mean? Well, the SN2 is bimolecular, meaning that it has two different molecules that must react together in order for the reaction to happen. And as a result, it will follow a bimolecular rate law. So the nucleophile must react with the leaving group to give the nucleophile plus the carbon plus the leaving group, right? So both molecules must collide for this to happen. And as a result, the rate of the reaction is dependent on both the concentration of the nucleophile and the concentration of the carbon of the leaving group, right? It is bimolecular. If we look at the reaction coordinate, this happens in one step. And so there's only one rate determining step in the process, right? There's only one activation barrier, and that is the activation barrier for the nucleophile to form the associative transition state with the carbon in the leaving group. Because this only follows one um, rate determining step and because it's bimolecular, oftentimes you'll see this information presented in a chart that looks like this, where the relative rate of the reaction is plotted against the concentration of nucleophile and the concentration of the carbon of the leaving group. If you notice in the second and third rows, if you double either the concentration of the nucleophile or the concentration of the carbon of the leaving group, you will double the relative rate of reaction. That is a telltale sign of an SN2 process as, a result, as opposed to an SN1 process, which we'll talk about more later. If you double both of them, you quadruple the rate of the reaction because the rate law is multiplicative. So two times two gives you a four fold increase in the rate of the reaction. Finally, I wanna go ahead and leave you with a quick animation, which will summarize the whole process of the SN2 reaction, including the stereochemical inversion, so that you can visualize it in a more dynamic manner. So initially, right, we have our anti-bonding orbital and our nucleophile with a high electron density. The nucleophile attacks the back end of the orbital and begins to form a partial bond in that associative transition state, which begins to break the bond towards the leaving group. The nucleophile then pushes all of the atoms upwards into that planar transition state pushing the electron density off onto the leaving group, eventually pushing it all the way towards the ultimate extent, breaking the bond to the leaving group completely, and then leaving you with a full new bond between the carbon and the nucleophile in the inverse stereochemical position. That is a new tetrahedral substituted carbon with an inverted stereochemistry at that chiral center. And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. And if you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to learn more, check out our other videos in the chemistry playlist. And if you're looking to branch out, check out our other science playlists as well. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.